come to our team. Thank you for and therefore the world, but especially in the city uh, that belongs to you that God has gone forth today. Bless, bless us today. Bless our Bible school. Bless every faithful member that's working in the Bible school. Lord, Lord, they have a busy schedule already, and yet they want to send boys and girls to the Christ. And so we pray that you'll bless them. Give us a great uh, number of children who will hear the gospel and be saved. We look forward to the days ahead. Your blessings upon us in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. All right, as we get ready to welcome you, just a <coughs> card to read to you. It says, uh, Dear church family, thank you for the prayers and the lovely flowers that I received on my recent surgery. Loving Christ, Judy King. And it's good to have Miss King back with us. Also, I'd like to mention Rose Fowler. Pray for Rose Fowler. We stopped by this morning to bring, take some lunch to them, and when we walked in, she started crying. She was having a bad day. Said so Mr. Fowler's medication, he can't remember anything, and she's not used to seeing him that way. So I told her I'd pass that on to you. So pray for Rose and Wayne Fowler along with your other requests as well. Well, it is good to see you today. We're glad you're here. The Word of God says, This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And we rejoice today that you're here. Whether you're a member or a guest, we're glad you're here. But if you are a guest, here's what we want you to do. If you, res well, you didn't get one coming in like we normally do, did you? Look right in front of you in the pew slot and you'll see a visitor card. If you'll take that and fill it out and when the offering plate goes by, just drop it in and we'll have a record of you being here. We'll send you a letter and tell you more about us and possibly to be able to schedule a visit where we can come in your home and uh, let you get to know us just a little bit better and tell you about some of our ministries here. If you look around, you'll see that uh, we are fixing to have something exciting happen next week. We'll tell you more about that at our announcements. But uh, So you fill that out. Uh, normally we'd have one on our bulletin thing, but we have a different bulletin just for this week. So fill that out, offer plate, come by, drop it in, and we'd appreciate that so much. We're going to have Brother Hill come and lead us in a song. I want you to stand to your feet, turn around and shake somebody's hand, tell them how good it is to see them today, how glad you are they made it to the house of God. And turn to 404. Let's sing the solid rock. I came in here this morning, I think we'll sing them both. <clears throat> uh, I thought about it, I was in here this week and I saw all these rock columns. I said, man, sing the solid rock. And then I came in this morning and uh, John Harris up there, he says, uh, okay, we need to sing a mighty fortress this morning. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, there's been a lot of work going to that. Mm, you just don't know. Let's sing the solid rock. Sing the first and last. on the gender, but it's page 26. Choir, you're going to have to stand up if we do this. Go to 26. Let's sing Martin Luther <coughs> wrote a mighty fortress.
let the ushers come forward for the offering on the last. <laughs> couple of things before we receive our offering. If you want to be in the golf tournament, there's a sign-up sheet right here in your bulletin. Be sure to sign that up and turn it in. And uh, Miss Hill will give you more information on that. Miss uh, Penny Hill, if you need more. Then Vacation Bible School. You can still help if you want to. You can just see me today. We've got our positions filled, but I'm sure there'll be somebody, something to happen, have to work late and we can still use some help. We have just a few of these left, not very many at all. If you want some of these, you just punch the hole out of them and you hang them on a doorknob to, to your neighbor's home and uh, then they can bring it and register for Vacation Bible School. So if you want some of those, they're on the front row. If you're a worker and you have not got, picked up your patch yet for your shirt, I need to see you this morning to give it to you and also your crown to wear. So everybody will kind of stand out that way we'll know who the workers are they were really excited about this when I showed them yesterday. So they, they said, we're going to look silly. I said, did you see what I was wearing last Sunday? Put it on my head. I don't care. <laughs> Mr. Hill has agreed. <laughs> All right. My head's too big. His head's too big or the crown's too small. So we, uh, but yeah, we want, we want to look a little different. So we want to stand out. We want people that come up visitors to know this is a worker. So can come and ask questions. Tomorrow, 6 o'clock to 8.30 is when it will be. Actually, we will start this morning. Um, we won't need any workers, but uh, the choir will dismiss at the end of the service and go down with something normally they don't do. And then we're going to lower the bridge and uh, we'll have our puppet show and then we'll have a special guest. Somebody said, oh, I'm glad you're going to let the choir down so they can see it. And I said, well, I hadn't really thought of that. We just didn't want that thing to follow anybody when we let that bridge down because... I built that baby, so she's probably not uh, very sturdy, so, but uh, we're glad that they're going to be able to see it as well. All right, let's pray for our offering. <laughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for a given church, people who not only sacrifice their finances, but are obedient to what you tell us to do, and because of that, we can have programs like the Vacation Bible School and our men's meeting next week, and all the different ministers who have, uh, one in prison and school, all the things that we have here uh, because of the people who are obedient to what you tell us to do. And we just thank you for that. Uh, God, we would ask that you would bless it, multiply it, that it could be used in great and mighty ways to reach not only our community but around the world with our mission program as we think about our missionary coming tonight. And thank you for that. Lord, we ask that you would continue to meet with us today. May everything we say and do from this point, our music, the preaching of the word, may it be pleasing to the ear of God. God, we'd ask that you would touch hearts this morning, that it'd be changing lives. Maybe somebody's never accepted Christ. We pray they would do that today. Maybe we're here today and there's just a distance between someone and you. We pray that you would reveal it to that heart and they would do business with you today. May we leave today. May we look back across this day and may we be able to truly say in our hearts it was good to be in your house. We ask and pray these things in the name of our Savior and your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ.
truly it does demand our soul and our life and our all. Uh, to me, that's one of the greatest songs that's ever been written and penned and set to music. Uh, while uh, Chris and Penny are getting ready to sing for you, choir practice at 515, and I thank the Lord that this church has a choir during the summer. Some of you know where I'm coming from. I thank the Lord for faithful choir members. They sign out when they're on vacation, and we work around them, and the Lord has blessed us. And, uh, come this fall, we'll be back to a full blown. But uh, I'd like to put in a plug. Uh, there's some of you that uh, I know singing in the choir takes a lot of time. Uh, we practice every week, and uh, it's out of the schedule. But some of you uh, could be a blessing to others by getting in the choir, and we'd love to have you. We start at 5, and then this fall we'll be back to 4.30 on Sunday evening. We could use you, and you could be used of God. That's the big thing. We'd love to have you. We can stand about 10 or 12 more members after everybody gets back. We can still do that many. We can put more chairs up there if we have that many. So I'll, I'll remedy the situation if we have too many. I don't think we ever have too many in serving the Lord. I appreciate my daughter-in-law and all the music she does. And I appreciate Chris as a young man serving the Lord. And they're going to sing for you this morning.
Turn in your Bible to John chapter 20, if you will, John chapter 20. I went to Charleston the first of the week to visit with my daughter and to be with her. And I got back on uh, Thursday, and there was one of those little door uh, knockers uh, on my door inviting me to vacation Bible school at Induce Baptist Church. I assume the teenagers were the ones that put it there on Wednesday evening because right down at the bottom it said, spot in first grade still open. And uh, so uh, I've got an idea which one may have had something to do with that, but uh, that's all right. We'll forgive. We have so many faithful people around here that do so much, and I hesitate uh, to hand out accolades because you're afraid you might overlook uh, someone. But to just to say uh, this morning how I appreciate the choir and the music and the musicians and uh, Brother Steve and his work on the grounds throughout the week. Uh, when Bobby Oaks resigned and we were looking for someone to take that place and Brother Steve said he would like to take it, I was thrilled and I am thrilled with the great work that he's doing. It takes a big man just to keep up with Ralph. So uh, uh, he's doing a good job. However, Steve... That's the worst glass of water I've ever drunk in my life, son. That is awful. Uh, normally it's not that bad, but uh, do a better job next time, all right? Looks like there's something in it. But anyway, uh, my daughter said to tell you how much she appreciated your prayers and how many of you have called me and have come to me and sent notes and said that you're praying for her. I appreciate that so much. And uh, she wants to just let you know that she appreciates that even though she's not a member of this church she appreciates your your prayers and I do as well what a what a fantastic church family we have uh, thank you so much now in John chapter 20 I want to bring you a message this morning entitled the best news ever heard the best news ever heard John chapter 20 begin reading in verse 1 the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter, and came first to the sepulchre. And he stooped down and looked in, and saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went unto the sepulchre, and seeth the linen clothes lie. And the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulchre, and saw and believed." For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher weeping. As she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulcher. And seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Now they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And when she had, said, had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing, and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and saith unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and to your Father, and to my God, and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord, and that he had spoken these things unto her. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, then came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Bad news can absolutely sap the life out of you. Bad news can absolutely just take all energy 
and all desire for living and all desire for going on right out of an individual. In the years of preaching, I've had to deliver bad news to people. It has never been an enjoyable thing. I remember delivering the bad news of a young man committing suicide, and I had to tell the parents. I remember probably the most difficult bad news I had to deliver was to a young wife with a young daughter just a few months old, and I had to go to her home, and when I knocked on the door, it was a Sunday evening after church, my wife was with me, we knocked on the door, and she came to the door with a smile on her face. And I'm standing there knowing that that smile is going to turn to tears in just a moment. I asked if we could sit down, and I delivered the news that in another county, some miles away, her husband had taken his life. And just like that, all hope, all joy, it just seemed like life itself had left uh, this young lady. Now, that's bad news. Bad news is, is a terrible thing, an awful thing. And I sure am glad that we have God's grace that they sang about a little while ago, that when bad news is delivered to us, that God will be with us and will strengthen us, and His grace is sufficient to take care of our needs. I talked this week to several people who are waiting for news. Uh, they don't have any news now. Uh, they don't know which way it's going to go. They, they don't know what uh, word is going to be given to them. It might be very good news. It might be very bad news. Uh, they're not really sure when the news is going to come to them. But there will be news coming directly to them about their physical condition, their physical situation that could turn their life completely around. So they're sitting there waiting for news. I have had the happy occasion uh, to deliver good news to people and to watch their expressions just literally uh, change and, and to see the joy just fill their soul and fill their heart. I've had the privilege of uh, telling people about the salvation of the souls of their children or their mom or their dad uh, or whatever it may be, and I've received good news myself. I'll never remember or never forget how joyous I was when I received the news that I'm, I graduated from college. Uh, and I thought, that is it now, you know, elementary school, and, or if you're up north, elementary school. Uh, and uh, the news that you, got to, that you graduated all of those years, and then uh, I found out pretty soon, no, there's more studies to come. Now you're going to have to work on your doctorate. And the greatest news was come when I finished that. And so I know a little bit about good news. In John chapter 20, we probably have the best news ever heard the best news ever delivered to anyone, and that's the fact of the resurrection of our Savior. He is risen from the dead. When Jesus said, it is finished, and when He rose from the dead, our salvation, everything that pertained to life and living, everything that pertains to our future was sealed right there as far as the child of God is concerned, as far as the church is concerned. Uh, good news. And here's the greatest news ever delivered that our Savior is risen from the dead. Have you ever thought about the resurrection? Real seriously about the resurrection? Uh, to us, uh, we accept it as a fact. And we take hold of it and we rejoice in it. But have you ever thought, what if Jesus had not risen from the dead? Have you ever thought about, what if it was a farce? What if it was a lie? What if we had been deceived? What if uh, this was not true? Have you ever thought about that? You read chapter 20, and what a great truth is uh, delivered here. But uh, think with me for just a moment. What if he had not risen from the dead? What if it was deception? What if it was a lie? If there were no resurrection, if Jesus had not been risen from the dead, his life would have been a fallacy. Now, I want you to think about the story of our Savior in the four Gospels, all that He did, all that He said that He did, and all that He said that He was. Here's a man that came and said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If He had not risen from the dead, that's not true. Had He not risen from the dead, you can say all you want to about your salvation, but there is no salvation and you're just as lost as can be. I'm just as lost as can be. Had He not risen from the dead. Remember back in the Old Testament when God came to Moses and He said, I want you to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses said, well, he won't listen to me. Who am I going to say sent me? 
well, I'm going to have to give a, a message. Somebody sent me. And God said, you go tell him, I am has sent you. Amen. That's all he needs to hear is, I am has sent you. Now here comes Jesus along, and he says, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me. And in the book of John, you see at least seven times the great statements, the great I am statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But had he not risen from the dead, all of that had been just as false as could be, and our salvation would have never been secure at all. Again, had Jesus not risen from the dead, all preaching would be meaningless. I've heard thousands of messages in my uh, lifetime. I've had the privilege of listening to some of the greatest preachers uh, from the Highland Park pulpit and, and uh, different churches that I have pastored and some tremendous messages and great messages about the Savior and about the grace of God and about the resurrection and about things that you and I hold dear. But if Jesus has not risen from the dead, all of that preaching is just foolishness. All of it is just foolishness. It's just silly. It's ridiculous. There's no need to have any preaching anymore had He not risen from the dead. And we rejoice in great preaching and we rejoice in preachers that deliver the message. But if this story is not true, if Jesus has not risen from the dead, uh, all of that preaching is just false. Just false all the way through. And then if He has not risen from the dead, faith is just an empty dream. I wake up of a morning and uh, I look at the world that we live in and look at the things that are happening in this world and I believe with all of my heart we're living in the last days and I believe what Paul said in the last days perilous times are going to come and men's hearts are going to begin to fail them for fear, all kinds of dreadful things happening uh, in, in this day and yet I can wake up of a morning and I can say yet in the midst of all of this I have faith in God. And I remember as a young man, it was faith in God that kept me going. When you were raised on a farm, and uh, that's the life that you know for about 18 years, and uh, then God calls you to preach, and you have the idea, there's no way I can do it. I'm just a simple country boy. I'm just a farmer. I'm a farmer's son. I don't know anything about this college thing. I don't know anything about this preaching thing. And yet, Lord, you call me. And it was faith in God that allowed me to move forward and to go on. And now I'm up in years and, and um, older than I used to be and I'm facing some things that I've not faced before, but yet I have faith in God. But it's foolishness, it's folly, it's useless if Jesus has not risen from the dead. Uh, you read chapter 20. Read it, read it again and read it for yourself and take hold of that chapter like you've never taken hold of it before and rejoice in the fact that everything He said about Himself is true. And it's not foolishness, and it's not an empty dream. Yes, there is joy in serving Jesus. Listen again. If He had not risen from the dead, all of our loved ones have perished. All of them. We'll never see them again. And there'll never be a reunion in heaven. And there'll never be the joy of seeing uh, those that we love. We'll never see them. If this is not true, you better take hold of the great fact of the resurrection. Uh, my dad is in heaven. My mother is in heaven. My grandmother is in heaven. I have some dear friends that I'm looking forward to seeing. And the older I get, the more heaven appeals to me. And the older I get, the more truths of the Word of God about heaven appeals to me. When you're young, you think you're going to live forever. Uh, you, you think you've got life by the tail and you're headed downstream. Uh, and you're headed downhill when you're a young man. And you think about your life and what you want to do in the future. And old age and death is way out there. But my Bible tells me life is a vapor. It appears for a little time and then it vanishes away. And as the years are going to roll by quickly... We're standing out of the vestibule uh, this morning, and Larry Matthews Jr. said to me, Look at these young people. It was just a few days ago that they were just little boys and girls, about like that. And now they're teenagers about to get out of high school and go on with their life. Life is passing, and people are going to die, and we're going to say goodbye to them. And if there's no resurrection, you'll say goodbye for the very last time was not just a few days ago until we said goodbye to Brother Malcolm Bardot and stood by the casket and looked in. And I remember Brian telling me that he took his little girls in 
And uh, he said, now I want you to touch Daddy's hand. You feel how warm it is? Yes. Now I want you to touch Papa's hands. Feel how cold it is? That means that he's not there. Now what would you tell a little child? You'll never see him again. That's it. You want to tell a little boy that? You want to tell a little girl that? That they'll never see their grandfather again? They'll never see their grandmother again? They'll never see their daddy again? Well, that's the truth if there's no resurrection. But if there's a resurrection, we'll see them again. Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Is that a joy to you? Is that exciting to you that there's a place called heaven? Now, um, I I've got a feeling. Uh, some people want to take away your joy when it comes to heaven, don't they? You know, they want to sort of have the idea that it's like floating around on a cloud playing a harp, and that's about it. Uh, heaven's a lot more than that. I've got a feeling, now you listen to me, I've got a feeling, listen, I believe the Bible bears me out that we're not going to lose our emotions just because we're on the other side. And I believe with all of my heart, listen to me, I believe with all of my heart at the resurrection of the dead and at the rapture of the church. What do you think you're going to do when you see your dad and mom? Do you think you're going to just stand there and say, oh, look over there, there's dad. Good to see you, dad. Oh, hey, mom, been a long time, hadn't it? Do you think that's the way it's going to be when we get there? I don't think so. I think there will be some tears of joy like you've never heard and like you've never seen. Can you imagine a mother that lost a little girl in infancy or a little boy in infancy and they see them again? Is that going to be just something that they're going to take lightly? Absolutely not. But all of that comes about, all of that takes a place because of the resurrection of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, if He's not risen from the dead, then we are of all men most miserable. Wait a minute now, Christian. You're here this morning because you believe in Jesus. I hope that's why you're here. You're a member of this church. You carry a Bible. Uh, we're having vacation Bible school. We do the things we do because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? But if He's not risen from the dead, forget it. Just take your Bible, close it, take it home, and don't ever open it again because there's nothing to it. Live any way you want to. Nothing's relevant. Uh, just uh, cheat and lie and step on people and get by the best way that you can if He's not risen from the dead. But because He is risen from the dead, we want to live right. Amen? And I believe my Bible bears me out here uh, that you and I have the greatest news, the greatest truth, uh, that here is our Savior. You see, this uh, verse talks about an empty tomb. An empty tomb. Now, it's amazing to me uh, the attitude of the disciples. If you read chapter 20, verses 1 through verse 10, there are some amazing uh, truths here. Um, look at the way the clothes of Jesus is folded neatly. Uh, this is not a matter of something haphazardly taking place. Uh, you see, He knew from the very beginning who He was. By the way, let me insert this. Did you know Joseph and Mary didn't teach Him who He was? He knew from the very beginning who He was. He was the Son of God. He was God in the flesh. He knew that. And He knew it from the beginning. And He knew it as He walked on the earth. He knew He would raise from the dead. He knew it. And when our Savior came back uh, from the grave, uh, these clothes lay so neatly there. Look at verse 7. And the napkin that was about His head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple which came first to the sepulcher and saw and believed. Now look at verse 9. For as yet they knew not the Scripture that He must raise again from the dead. Isn't that amazing? How many times did Jesus say, I'm going to die, but I'm going to be raised from the dead? How many times did He say that? And yet they didn't get a hold of it. Christian, it's possible to know the truth but not really hold to the truth. That's what's wrong with our churches today. Oh, I believe, yeah, I believe that. I believe that, but we don't really believe it because it would change our lives if we really believed it. Somehow we've lost the thrill, we've lost the joy, we've lost the power, we've lost all of it. We, uh, we say we believe it, and here we ought to rejoice in the fact that there is an empty tomb, an empty tomb. 
They look in and they see the tomb is empty, contrary to the expectations of his friends. It's all over. You see, they were looking for something that uh, God never told them was going to happen. Uh, they didn't quite understand what the Old Testament said about the Messiah. Some of them even believed there were two Messiahs, a suffering Messiah and a conquering Messiah. They, they couldn't put all the Scriptures together, and it didn't take hold uh, of their lives. And, and the, the Bible says they've gone away. They forsook Him, and they fled, and they're gone. And the Scripture had never really gotten hold of them. And so His resurrection, the empty tomb, contrary to the expectations of His friends, it was contrary to the precautions of his enemies. Why, they took every precaution to see that that body and that tomb was guarded. Nobody was going to get in there. The best soldiers, the strongest men, men that feared no one. You got the picture? And yet they said, we're going to see to it that nobody steals the body away uh, we're going to make sure that the truth is, uh, is given, uh, that he's not who he said that he was, and yet he rose from the dead, contrary to all other tombs in history. All the great uh, church leaders are in a tomb. Uh, all the great founders of religion in a tomb somewhere. Go, go, go find their tomb. Their bones are there. Their remains are there. But you go to this tomb and he's not there he is risen. Amen? He is risen. Now, here's the best news. Why is it the best news ever heard? Why is it the best news ever delivered? Let me give you three thoughts. Number one, it's the greatest news ever delivered because it's true. Because it's true. Uh, you know, we hear good news sometimes, and it's so good, we think, can it be true? Uh, I've noticed something. Uh, you better ask that question when you see an advertisement on television. Is it true? Uh, they've, uh, it, it amazes me the things they'll tell you about on, on, on television. Uh, you can get a suntan with getting out, without getting out in the sun. It's in a bottle. And just rub that stuff on. Yeah, and you turn pink and gray and orange and all different colors. And they make all kinds of claims. And then you sit down at your computer, right? And you're, you're, you're typing, and all of a sudden, here's a pop-up, and they, if you'll buy this product, and if you'll buy that product, it's the greatest thing in the world. I'll help you win at the stock market, you know. And you take a good close look at it, and, and there's nothing to it. And it's leading you down the wrong path. But I'm saying something this morning you can bank on. This is something that's true. This is something from the Word of God. Uh, I rejoice in the resurrection because it's true. There's been some great news given to us. Uh, down through history. Uh, the end of World War II, that was great news. The end of the Vietnam War, that was great news. The fall of the Berlin Wall, that was great news. The fall of communism as we see it, as we think it uh, might be, w w was great news. But here's the greatest news of all, because it is true. Four individuals are eyewitnesses to the account to the empty tomb. The Old Testament said at the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. And you have four who went to the empty tomb. They saw it. They said, this is true. The angel standing by said the same thing. And Paul said that he was seen above 500 brethren at once. Some man said there's more evidence that Jesus rose from the dead than there is that George Washington ever existed. Well, I don't know about that, but I know one thing, he's not there. And it's great news that he is not there. Uh, the empty tomb itself uh, depicts the fact that he's not there. The character change in the disciples. You ever thought about that? Running, afraid, fearful, and now the resurrection and the truth dawns upon them and the belief hits them right between the eyes and right in the heart. And now you turn to the book of Acts, and it is said of these same cowardly disciples, listen, these that have turned the world upside down have come hither also. What changed that? The resurrection. What changed these cowardly disciples into men who were, listen, willing and did give their lives for the cause of Christ? Martyred. What a change that took place in them. 
Uh, I would pray today that we'd have that change, same change taking place in our life. I'm willing to pray the Lord will make that kind of a change in me. Are you willing to make that kind of a, a plea and say, Lord, help me to change, help me to believe this, help me to take it to everybody that he is risen from the dead? And then we have another change that is so important. You have the change from the Sabbath day of worship. And think about the Jews changing from that from Saturday to Sunday up on the first day of the week. Why? Because of the resurrection. And from that day forward until this day now, you see Christians worshiping on the first day of the week. Celebration of the resurrection. Celebration of the fact that our redemption is secure. That's why we come on Sunday. And by the way, I don't think you can come to church too much. I like to be here. I like to celebrate the fact that He is risen. I like to be with God's people. Amen? And so why is it the best news ever given? Because it's true. Secondly, why is it the best news ever given? Because it came after apparent defeat. It came after parent, apparent defeat. The disciples were gloomy. The Christians were down. Uh, they were defeated. Uh, they were depressed. It looked like all things were over. Everything had ended as far as they knew was concerned. They had seen the trial. And I realize that preaching through the book of John on Sunday morning, I know that we've not hit every element. We've not hit every area, and that's not been my intent to do that. Uh, I would like to have done that, but we've not done so. We've only hit the highlights. We've only taken a bird's eye view of John's gospel. But if you were to take a real close look in chapter 18 and chapter 19 and see the things that Jesus went through. Some people say that the trial was even more severe in its intensity and pain than the crucifixion itself. And you put on top of that the garden, the time in the garden. Put all of that together. Because you see the cat -of nine tails that the Roman soldiers used usually was enough to kill an ordinary man. Many of them died even before they got to crucifixion. And could not even make their way. And then you place on top of that the time of the carrying of the cross to uh, Calvary itself. And you look at the trial and all the things that takes, took place and the disciples looking at that. And then you look at the crucifixion itself. Now, uh, you can't just read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and get the total picture of the, of the crucifixion. You need to go back to the Old Testament and go back to uh, the book of Psalms chapter 22. And you'll get an idea of the emotional and spiritual suffering that Jesus endured on the cross. Not only the physical suffering, but the emotional and spiritual suffering. And it talks about the bulls of Bashan. The great bulls of Bashan have compassed upon me. And Bible scholars believe that that refers to demonic attacks. Uh, the people were looking at the, the blood and looking at the the cross and, and looking at all of that. But they couldn't see the demonic activity that was taking place as Jesus hung on the cross. And only a few of the people were there, of course, that were believers that stood by. Uh, but word got around of what took place. Things looked awfully gloomy. When you look at the trial and uh, the fact that Pilate tried to let the Lord go and seven times he said, this is an innocent man. And the dream that his wife had and the fact that the trial uh, was illegal, and yet uh, Pilate, because he was not willing to give up his loyalty uh, to Caesar and wanted to please the people and all of it, he said, oh, all right, I'll, I'll go through with it. You look at all of that. Then you look at the burial. A burial is so final, isn't it? So final. I remember when we buried my grandmother and, and my father and, and, and my mother, I remember that it was all pretty much all right as long as people were around you and even at the funeral home and your friends are there and they're talking to you. But when you go to the grave site and you lower the body into the grave, and I've never, I've never understood uh, stood this. I've never understood some things that these funeral directors do. I wish they'd, I've said some things to them. Why don't, they, why don't they get those guys that are just standing over there with shovels waiting to throw the dirt in? Why don't they, they put them out of sight somewhere? 
till the family gets away. But they seem to always want to do that. And here are these guys standing over there who don't know the deceased. They don't know the, the family and the of the Jews. And by the way, we're living in a day when uh, the heartbreak of others really don't touch us like it used to. And the pain of others really don't, doesn't touch us like it used to. Well, let's get this thing over and get on with life. I've even seen families that had, it seemed to me like they had the idea, well, let's get Daddy in the ground so we can go on. Let's get Mom in the ground so we can go on. I don't know whether you've seen that or not, but I have. Maybe because we preachers see more and hear more than others do. And so here's the, looks like it is so final. And the tomb, and the, the, the uh, mighty boulder rolled up uh, on the tomb. It looked like it was so final. And it looked like it was an apparent defeat. But actually what was an apparent defeat turned into be the greatest event in history. And Satan's doom sealed there at the resurrection of our Savior. You've all heard the uh, account of Wellington and Napoleon. And you've heard the story that England was waiting for the news. Who won the battle? And then finally the ship came into the harbor and the, the message was given and uh, the fog began to roll in and all that the uh, courier saw was this, Wellington defeated. And all of Britain went into sorrow because they thought that they were defeated. And then the fog cleared away and the message came in bright and clear, Wellington defeated Napoleon. And all joy broke loose in that country because of that. Well, what looked like a defeat turned into the greatest victory the world has ever known. Thirdly and lastly, it's the greatest news that we could ever hear because of what it proves. Because of what it proves. First of all, it proves that the Bible is the Word of God. You love the book. You love it. You really love it. You know, if we really loved it, we'd read it more, wouldn't we? And we'd commit it to memory more than we ever, had, ever did before. Dr. John R. Rice consumed the Word of God. I heard Dr. John R. Rice preach, and so much of his sermons were just Bible and quoting the Bible. What a great love for the Bible uh, that he had. And on and on we could go. And, uh, you know, you don't love a book that's, that, that's, that's false. I don't, how can you love a book that's false? Uh, I, I don't understand that, but here's the Word of God that's true. It said our Savior was, was God. It said that He would, would, would go to the grave, but He would be risen from the dead. It proves not only the fact that the Bible is true, but it proves His deity, that He was who He said that He was. But let me come to my last thought. It proves that those who believe in Jesus are justified before God. Turn back to Romans chapter 4. Look at verse 25. Romans chapter 4. And verse 25, who was delivered, of course, talking about Jesus. The word delivered is entrusted. Let me pause there for a moment. You're pretty healthy today. You're pretty healthy today. Everything seems to be okay. But you know some news could come to you, disturbing news that you're not as healthy as you thought you were. And the news could come that you don't have too much longer to live. That could happen, you know. It has happened, and it could happen. And the thought would come to you, you know, if that's true, and I've only got a few days left to live on this earth, I'm going into eternity. Now, you sat here this morning in pretty good health, and eternity's a long way off. May I say something this morning? Eternity might be just around the corner another heartbeat, another second away. If we really believe that, maybe we wouldn't treat each other as badly as we treat each other. Maybe we'd be a little kinder. Old folks used to say, if you can't say anything good about anybody, then just don't say anything. Maybe if we really believed that any moment, any second, we'd go out into eternity, that gets you to think, doesn't it? Who will be the first person that I'll see? When this heart quits beating and this life ends and uh, 
in a second of time, just maybe one-tenth of a second, you leave this life and you're in eternity. What's going to be the first thing that you're going to think about? What's going to be the first thing? What will come to your mind? If you're sitting here today and you're lost, the first thing that's going to come to your mind is this. All that preaching was true and I wouldn't listen. And now I don't have one other chance. It's over. All I have is facing eternity in a Christless, eternal lake of fire. But if you're a Christian... Maybe the first thing you'll think about is, you know, why didn't I do more? Why did I let so many things pass by me? You know, why didn't I sing in the choir? You know, why didn't I help Dwight in vacation Bible school? I could have. Why did I waste so many opportunities to go visiting? And maybe the sad part of, of it all is going to be this. You know, that one thing that always tripped me up, I never got the victory over it. Why didn't I just do more? Why didn't I obey the Word of God? Why didn't I say yes to the Lord and give myself completely to Him? Paul said, the time of my departure is at hand. Hmm. Wow. Wow. What if I said that this morning? What if you said that this morning? The time of my departure is at hand. And then he went on to say, I fought a good fight. I've kept the course. I've kept the faith. I've finished the course. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. If we look at it like that, maybe we'll think a little bit more seriously about how we're living right here and now. Maybe we'll do what Paul said. Forgetting the things which are behind... And reaching forth unto the things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You know, there's obviously things in my life and things in your life we're not proud of. But you know what? If they're in the past and they're forgiven, then leave them in the past and move on to the future. I'm just trying to say he, entr he was entrusted with our salvation. And here's what I was getting at. When we wake up on the other shore, we'll be glad that our salvation was trusted in the one in whom we could trust to take us home. So he said, who was delivered for our offenses, that is our sins, who was raised again for our justification. Literally, we were acquitted. We're guilty but someone paid our guilt, someone paid for our sin, and that was the Lord Jesus. And all of that's true because He rose from the dead. But have He not risen from the dead, then we're of all men most miserable. So let me say in closing this morning, let every young man and every young lady in this auditorium this morning, even though you may feel you're going to live forever, you're not going to live forever. Live for Him. Let me say something to you young people that are sitting right here before me. There's a many of an adult in this building this morning would love to go back to where you are, to your age, and to where you sit now, and live it over. They'd do it differently. They'd do some things differently. And you've got a chance to live your whole life for the glory of God. And we who are adults, however many days we've got up on this earth, how many years we've got up on this earth, because He rose from the dead, let's live for Him. Would you stand with heads bowed and eyes closed? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, the choir is going to sing a song of invitation. I'm going to be standing here at the front to meet anyone that may need to come. Now, here is our invitation today. If you've never received the Lord Jesus as your Savior, and the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart, come this morning and let us take the Word of God and show you how you can be saved and how you can know it. If you're here today and you're a Christian, and you've not been proclaiming the resurrection, you've not been living out the truth of the resurrection in your life, come this morning for the rededication of your life. 
Maybe you'd like to join our church by letter, by statement, by baptism. I want to invite you to come this morning. Whatever your need is, Father, as the choir sings, bring those who need to come. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. On that first stanza, would you come? We're here to help you. Choir, sing if you will. Shelter in which we can hide. That's so true. are about, our eyes are closed, and while we're helping people here at the auditorium, at the front of the auditorium, I want to say to you this morning, young or old, if you cannot say this morning, I know that I'm saved. Maybe you made a profession of faith, but maybe you know in your heart you were never really born again, and you need help with that. I want to invite you to come. Christian friend, are you living for the Lord today? Are you living out that resurrection truth in your life every single day? If not, would you come? Let him have his way with you. Our heads are bowed. Let's sing another stanza, Brother Hill. Choir, sing it.